Salo for Lava, you're listening to Pacific Waves from RNZ Pacific. Coming up. Some of their areas have been destroyed. Two weeks on from Super Typhoon Moa, parts of Guam are still without power or water. Also, to our people who have journeyed through that ocean to come to Aotearoa and have contributed enormously, this is a way of giving back. Plans for a bus week of Fale on Wellington's waterfront gets the green light. And later on, a church leader in Papua calls on Indonesia's president to cease military operations. But first up, some brief updates from around the Pacific. We're in Samoa. Downpours occurred on June 8 in the morning, causing flooding and river surges. Savai'i was the worst affected by the weather, with roads submerged by overflows and bridges closed. Rain and flooding has since subsided. The capital Apia, along with most parts of Upolu, are largely unaffected by the rain. Samoa Meteorology Division Officer Silipa Mulitsalo says they're monitoring the weather system. We are seeing, uh, you know, in, uh, decreasing rainfall activities. So we are, we can imagine the next 12 hours to six to 12 hours uh, for all the rainfall to run off to the oceans. Uh, but there's still a lot of moisture around the area. So in the next 24 hours, there is still the potential for heavy downpours from time to time. In the space of 12 hours, it only took Super Typhoon Moa to pummel through Guam, and two weeks on, the small island is still recovering. The typhoon brought sustained wind speeds of up to 225 kilometers per hour, and in some locations, rain exceeding half a meter. Parts of the island are still without power and water. Caleb Fotheringham spoke with Derido Village Mayor Melissa Savares about the response. Mayor, we're two weeks on since Typhoon Mawa made landfall. Where are we currently at in terms of getting back up to where we were previously? So our utilities are struggling. We have power to about maybe 50% of the community. Water is about maybe a little over 50%. Water is slowly coming up as well. That's the struggle is, of course, we need utilities, especially our water, when it comes to uh, people are taking care of their hygiene. We need drinking water. Uh, Fortunately enough, we have the drinking water that's available through FEMA. So that's how we're kind of hydrating ourselves right now. Residents, as far as potable water, for those that do not have water at their homes, there are still some tankers. In our community, we have three tankers available, and then my northern neighbor of Jigo has also two or three tankers as well for our residents to get water from. It's obviously been two weeks. It's a little bit of time. Is this slow, the response? This is slow, but, you know, I've been through super typhoons, It's about the same time period, but, you know, our infrastructure has improved over the years. So considering that we have improved infrastructure, I feel that it is very slow. And is that the feeling amongst the community as well? Yes. That's actually the frustration because the community knows we have extra fees attached to our uh, utility bill for improved infrastructure. And that's the frustration is that we have improved infrastructure as far as utilities are concerned, yet it's taking much more time to get those back in place. Have the utilities given reasons to why it's taken so long? Not really. You know, the, the communication, they'll send out press releases on what percentage is back on, but they're not giving the reasons why it's it's not on yet. Right. Let's talk about Didido for a minute. That's in North Guam. So was that one of the worst areas hit by Typhoon Mawa? Because I'm aware that the eye passed through parts of the north of Guam. Yes. So it it's not the northern village of the island. Uh, we have Jigo, which is the most northern, when they're just my neighbors. We didn't feel the eye. But my neighbors next door in Jigo did feel it, where they had that eye break. You know, we always call it that that little time break where uh, 
the storm kind of subsides, but we know it's because of the, uh, you know, you have the front end of it, and then you have your eye, and then then the tail end whips us good, right? So in Betty, though, we didn't feel the eye. We didn't have the eye go over us, but we felt that the winds got stronger, and we knew when the, the wind direction turned, we knew we were in for a, a big surprise at the end of it, right? And at the end of it, um, were you worse affected than other villages? Yes. Other than the flooding, we saw the damages, uh, trees all, and, and even roofs. We still have some, some substandard homes water that are either semi-concrete with a tin roof, or um, we still had some tin and wood uh, structures that were totally destroyed. Thankfully, some families made it to the shelter on time, and then others just stayed in place, but looked, you know, went into the bathroom of their home, which was the safest place for most families, and they stayed there until the wind subsided. And are people back at work now, or are they just waiting for power to come back on? Some employers are back there because their power is on, or some don't have power. So what they're doing is they're staggering their team. Some businesses have opened partially because they don't have power, but they have water. Some employees have actually gone back. Others, because uh, there's a, you know, some of their areas, workspaces have been destroyed. Uh, they're having to do cleanups in those areas first. When is the water and power expected to come back on? I saw a notice today that it, things should come together by the 26th of the month. So that's two more Sundays. You know? So we're patient, right? But I don't know for how much more. <laughs> The Falimalai Trust in Wellington has received a council approval to seek a resource consent for a multi-purpose Pacific cultural building on the city's waterfront. Council has voted overwhelmingly in favour of the trust development plan for the capital's Frank Kitts Park and for the preparation of a resource consent submission. Koroi Hawkins reports. There were celebrations all around for proponents of the Fale Malai project following the Wellington City Councillor's vote. The Trust believes the Fale or building will be a focal point for all New Zealanders to gather, learn and celebrate the contribution of Pacifica arts, cultures and histories to New Zealand's national identity. Fale Malai Trust Chair Adrian Orr told councillors this country was built off the backs of Pacific peoples and so it's been incredible to see the goodwill and support for the Fale Malai project. You know, the amount of effort that um, from the trustees and all of the connectedness from the government, from business uh, across the country, from embassies, ambassadors from the Pacific Islands and from the communities. Fale Malai trustee Loa Manuvao Damewini Laban welcomed the approval by councillors. I'm enormously humbled because this is about um, a, a positive response to our parents' journey, to our people who have journeyed through that ocean to come to Aotearoa and have contributed enormously. This is a way of giving back. Loa Manuvao Damewini says the Fale is a powerful symbol of New Zealand's connection to the Pacific region. Vic O'Connor of the Tonkin and Taylor Group, who is the chief engineer for the Trust, says the next phase of the project is a resource consent. That's quite a process and that, that will probably take for the, the rest of the year. Um, and once we have that, then we can start um, you know, getting, getting the, the funds, get, raising the funds. We, we've, we've already obviously put out a lot of feelers for funds, but uh, that will have to be done in earnest after we get the resource consent. Um, and then we can start... Um, we, we can start... Earlier this year in March, there had been some opposition voiced about locating the Fale Malai at Frank Kitts Park, with the Wellington Civic Trust saying it would pursue legal action if resource grants were approved. The West Papua Council of Churches is calling on Indonesian President Joko Widodo to cease military operations in West Papua and seek dialogue with the West Papua Liberation Army, or TPNPB. An escalation of violence has taken place in the territory 
following the kidnapping of Kiwi pilot Philip Mertens in February. West Papua Council of Churches moderator Reverend Benny G.I. told Finau Funua that Mertens' life is in danger and that dialogue is needed. Reverend G.I., the West Papuan Council of Churches is sending out a letter to President Joko Widodo. What is being said in this letter? Uh, we are telling the Indonesian government that, that uh, if they don't allow the church to go in, we will, we, we will assume that, we will conclude that the Indonesian government is in, uh, involved in the death of uh, pilot. Because uh, we understand that pilot is taken hostage by TPNPB to demand something from political change from Jakarta and to stop that government has to take a, 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 peace, a peace approach. That's what we are planning. But as of now, I cannot say anything about, I cannot guarantee anything about the uh, church involvement because... Up until now, the government is not taking our, our voice, our t- t- taking our statement seriously. What we are concerned now is we want a church, church team to go in, but to do that, we have, we have we wanted the military to be withdrawn. If that, that's happened, we can uh, have a peaceful talk with Agianus. Uh, communicate with him, find out what he wants, and we want to see pilot. We want to make sure that uh, again to tell us where the how 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 is the condition of pilot. That is our first priority. And what about the New Zealand government? Uh, have you heard from them? Do you do you think? Uh, we will make it clear also in our statement that New Zealand government and international community, community to pressure the Indonesian military, Indonesian government to uh, to give us a dialogue, a peaceful dialogue. We know that uh, again the TPNPB leader has also uh, uh, proposed a kind of uh, a talk, peaceful talk. And the government has not responded to that talk. And we are asking this, this uh, through our letter that the Guyanus has, the TPNPB has uh, offered a peaceful talk. Why can you take it? So we want New Zealand government to give more pressure on the nation to, on the international community to pressure the nation to have a peaceful talk. The United States Agency for International Development, USAID, has more than 10,000 staff and a multi-billion dollar annual budget. And the organization is planning to bring more of those staff and those dollars to help our Pacific Island countries. USAID has had a very small presence here in recent years, but as Washington focuses more on China, it's also rediscovering its friends in the Pacific. The Manila-based Deputy Assistant Director of USAID, Betty Chung, told on Wiseman more about U.S.'s plans for the region. From last year's historic U.S. Pacific Island Country Summit in Washington, D.C., President Biden announced the U.S. Pacific Partnership Strategy that affirmed you know, several commitments in that strategy, including increasing U.S. presence in the region. So as part of that U.S. effort, the USAID is re-establishing our mission in Suva, Fiji. We plan to do that in August of this year. And the new mission will be called USAID Pacific Islands, and we'll oversee programs in um, Fiji, Kiribati, Nauru, Samoa, Tonga, Tuvalu, uh, Marshall Islands, Micronesia, and Palau. And we're also elevating our country office currently in Port Moresby in uh, Papua New Guinea. We'll elevate that to a country representative office, and that office will oversee development programs in Papua New Guinea, Solomon Islands, and Vanuatu. We have been in the Pacific Islands for a while, but we had closed our mission in Fiji back in, I believe, the mid-1990s. So it's pretty exciting to ramp up our staff there. When I first got here a year ago, we had two foreign service officers serving as development advisors in Suva. And now we just hired two Pacific Islander staff. So that's exciting. And then um, we have more uh, announcements and positions and interviews. And we hope to have um, a good team of like eight to 10 people in Fiji by the end of the year. 
our vision is to have an up and running mission there of a, at least 30. Um, and we're, we're moving rapidly toward that. I mean, in addition to people, though, we are increasing our programs in the Pacific. Prior to COVID-19, our focus in the Pacific Islands was really focused on some environment, regional environment programs. And we weren't in the health or education sector. We had also been very active in humanitarian assistance. Of course, that's one of USAID's yeah. strengths, our Bureau for Humanitarian, right? And a, a few disaster resilience projects, but really uh, more on the disaster response. I imagine there are a lot of people in the Pacific happy to see you, but you must also be running into questions about why? Why a delay? Why weren't you here? Why haven't you been here more often? Mm -hmm. And is it because of our need or is it because of Washington's desire to try and stop China from gaining more influence here? I think, you know, um, first of all, I would say USAID's been in the Pacific Islands for a while. We've been there since the 80s, I believe. Not to any great extent. Right. Well, I mean, you know, I feel that whatever programs we had back in back in that time had impact in those communities. And I, I see that whenever I travel throughout the Pacific Islands, I'll go to a village or, or I'll be talking to leaders and they'll remember a USA project in, in, in their province or their community. And it's very heartening to know that those small interventions at the time really, you know, meant something to those people. But at the same time, I hear you. Yes, our funding levels were, are not at the level that they were now. I joined a year ago, but even three years ago, the Pacific Island budget for the development assistance, it's tripled in the last three years. And we've designed a lot more programs in terms of in the environment and climate uh, adaptation and mitigation space. And we're looking at a digital connectivity project, a lot more economic growth projects. We're very interested in more global health security projects. I think the response is clearly, you know, USA didn't even have a Pacific Islands strategic framework, but we do now. One of these things was announced this past week in Papua New Guinea, mm -hmm. where money is going to go towards peace and security programs and a lack of peace and a lack of security is a huge issue in Papua New Guinea. So what is it that USAID can do there? For Papua New Guinea, what USAID is doing is really listening to what the different island countries have identified that they need the United States to do to support them in their development goals. So in Papua New Guinea, this was an area that was identified as something that they needed our support in. And so, you know, with USAID, we get congressional funding, and that was the Global Fragility Act funding that we had. And then this is the area that we're working with Papua New Guinea to support their peace and security programs and to bolster their sustainable and equitable economic growth and really help them with their goals in terms of strengthening their communities to be a lot more resilient in the areas of health and climate adaptation. So for us, our increase in funding in the Pacific Islands is and where we're planning to invest those funds is really driven by the needs that the Pacific Islands have identified themselves, especially in the 2050 uh, Blue Pacific Continent Strategy. And we look to that strategy as really a marker to what the Pacific Island countries have said that they need development agencies such as USAID to do to partner with them and to deliver on reaching these development goals. We heard recently about the, the work that's going in to reform the public service in Vanuatu, and I understand similar sorts of things are going to be done pretty much across the region by USAID. Is that okay? It depends on the country context. Absolutely. USAID works with the government and the countries that we serve. We really listen to what they say they need. And so in Vanuatu in particular, they asked us for technical assistance and support on some of the system reforms in, in um, their civil service. And that's one of the strengths and, and in terms of what USAID can provide is technical assistance in certain areas. Definitely. You know, we have a great democracy and governance program that helps different island countries in terms of ensuring that they have free and fair elections and make sure that their elections are very accessible. For example, in 2022, the election in Fiji, we had a USAID project that trained you know, election officials to help people with disabilities to be able to vote. And that's something that we're very proud of. Some of the little places, the smaller countries, Tuvalu, mm -hmm. what's happening yeah. there? I have yet to visit there, but I have been to another small 
small island country, Palau, for example. You know, the, it's just very interesting to me. The challenges that they face is so unique and different. But you know, one of the projects that we're very proud of is the Pacific American Fund. It's a it's a grant program that looks to local organizations to provide a concept in terms of a quest for funding. And it can amount from anywhere from a hundred thousand to a million, depending on what their needs are, where they pitch a concept in terms of what their community or their country needs. And uh, right now we're going through the third round of grants. We're awarding a second round of grants. And this is an example of where a small country like Tuvalu, the organizations in Tuvalu can approach USAID, ask for funding to make interventions in their communities that they've identified as a need for themselves. And then how can we, USAID, come alongside and help support their efforts to meet those challenges? That's Pacific Waves for today. To listen back, head over to rnzi.com slash programs. You can also download us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and iHeartRadio, or wherever you get your podcasts from. So from myself and the team here at RNZ Pacific, till fast week four.